everyone, Elon here with Jordan again, and we're going to have a great discussion on masculinity. Specifically this week, we're going to talk about courage, as it's a very, very important virtue. Jordan was saying some amazing things before we started recording, so I was like, wait, 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 cut it off. <laughs> we, got, we got to get it on, uh, <laughs> on the podcast. So uh, for those of you who don't know Jordan, he's brilliant. Me and him have had numerous discussions on masculinity and these issues that have arrived, uh, ar arisen over you know the past years and so part of what we've been discussing lately is virtues and and the whole range of them and kind of the the importance of virtues and the importance of rites of passage and all these concepts so specifically today we're going to zone in 100 percent focus on courage as jordan put it to me the most valuable virtue the most necessary virtue and uh i'm gonna let you take it from here jordan and jump right in yeah well, to me, I mean, you know, in my own thought experiments and my own kind of meditations and reflections, I've, I've arrived at at least the, the appreciation and kind of belief that courage is, is, is the cardinal virtue. And when I say that, the reason that I would place courage as the cardinal virtue, um, it's like if you were to view it on a, on a, on a um, chart, I don't know that I would, that I would put courage at the top as much as I would put it in the middle with like other virtues kind of branching out from it. The reason being, so again, like, you know, in these series right now, in this series right now, we're kind of like exploring virtues as a, as a concept, virtues as a component of manhood. And now we're kind of delving into more specific virtues themselves and kind of really wanting to flesh those out and explore what they are. Um, why would I start with courage? When you look at cross-cultural virtues, we named them last week, some being discipline, responsibility, uh, hard work, um, dignity, justice, generosity, um, humility. Those things can are inaccessible to somebody who isn't engendering and touching base with the most foundational uh, or, or the most basic aspect of courage in their heart. You know, for example, you want to take humility. If I'm afraid, if I'm, if, if I'm uh, giving into or b bending the knee to my fear of being seen as less than, or my fear of not being respected, or my fear of not being seen or acknowledged, humility is going to be really hard for me. If I'm afraid that I am less than, if I'm afraid that I'm going to get walked on, I'm going to be posturing like Napoleon all day long from a place of uh, inadequacy and fear, but having courage to face that fear of my own inadequacy and my own imperfection and just accept it for what it is and accept it as part of everybody else's lot. And to come to terms with that from a place of courage, I can act from a place of humility. It's the same thing with generosity. If I'm afraid, I'm not going to have enough. If I'm afraid, I don't I won't get enough. If I'm afraid I'm not going to make enough money, what I have is not enough. I'm going to be a hoarder, right? I'm going to hoard attention. I'm going to hoard money. I'm going to hoard material things. I'm going to hoard um, uh, interest in myself and not even have the capacity to care about others from a place of generosity and charitableness. That's from fear, from fear that I don't have enough that I might not get enough that I might not have enough to sustain me. Generosity requires courage, leaning into um, a place of becoming bigger, a place of, of understanding that I do have not only enough, but more to give. And it's a simple like spiritual repositioning or mental repositioning. Um, but I think courage is the key to all of these virtues. And beyond that, I think that when, when we when we act, um, I think that acting and living courageously and acting and living cowardly are both kind of vicious. Well, acting and living cowardly is, is a vicious cycle. Let's put it that way. Acting courageously, one constantly has to renew um, that commitment, that covenant. It's, ne it's a never ending cycle that must yeah. be renewed. You know, courage is like, it wouldn't be courage if there wasn't fear there, right? I mean, an, an, an intrinsic element of courage is that there is fear, that there is some fear that's being confronted and, and a person is confronting that willingly and coming up to meet it where it is and 
meet it with all that they have from a place of, uh, you know, who they are and honesty and integrity. You, you know, that's the, that's the, you know, just to kind of, to begin with, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, so I will say that I have always fundamentally felt that people act out of one of two places. They act out of fear or act out of love. I mean, uh, I, you know, and all things can be broken down to kind of those two base, you know, visceral positions when you, you're about to do something. And, and fear is often the, if you're, if you have a choice and it seems hard to go in one direction, very easy to go in the other one. Often fear is the easy choice and love is the hard choice. And so it takes courage, like you yeah. said, to act out of love. It takes courage to do what you genuinely believe is right. A lot of the time, as we touched on last week, the position of truth is often in many times historically, even today, especially today, I would argue the one that is most challenged. And so it takes courage to stand up and act out of love, act out of truth. And so uh, whenever I, it's just an interesting note to say that you had said like, a, you know, humility, or it comes from all these insecurities. And so to be secure with your insecurities, and then to come from a place of courage there and say to look at yourself and see yourself as imperfect, to see yourself as flawed and say, okay, I know I'm aware I'm flawed, but I'm still capable. I can still have a voice. I can still do these things. I think that's what courage really is represented by. To pull it into the more relevant and the more uh, immediate kind of stuff that we see going on in the world today, I would say that courage is sadly the virtue that has been most under attack. When mm -hmm. we see cancel culture, when we see the attacks on, on basic truths, these are things that are able to challenge truth, able to challenge rational thought, because we've been so attacked on the front of courage, because courage has been has decayed over time, we're teaching, not to put it in a way that's controversial, but we're, we're really trying to take away masculinity, teach men not to be men anymore, teach men not to stand up for what they believe in anymore. And so with that, you kill courage. And I think that's why we see a lot of the problems we do in society today. I think that's why a lot of people like I said, with my company, when we put out these messages, they come back and they, they say to, to me, hey, you know, I really appreciate your message. I wish I could do that. I'm like, but you can do that. You do have yeah. a voice. You do have the power to do that. There are two choices. You're either going to act out of fear or you're going to act out of courage. You're going to act out of love. Yeah. And so, so many people nowadays are, in, are taking inaction or are self-censoring or all these things because we have learned not to be courageous. We are being, yeah. we're almost being pushed into the category of losing that virtue, which I agree with you is the most fundamental virtue because from courage comes action. With no courage, there is no action. There is no society. You yep. will become complacent and just lay on your back and die. I mean, I think it's worse than that. You know, so like <clears throat> last week, we kind of touched on this. When you think about these virtues, courage included, they stand in contradistinction to to our base nature, to things that if we don't cultivate the virtues, the ways that we will naturally act. The, 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 the opposite of courage is cowardice, right? The opposite of acting courageously is acting cowardly. It's, it's giving into one's fear. And, and in my perspective, I think that the most base instinct that we have is self-preservation, is the instinct to preserve our corporeal body and our, our beating heart in our life. And if we act out of that place only all of the time, obviously it's a precondition. There's, there's the, uh, oh, whatever you call it, the, the hierarchy of needs or whatever that must be, that yeah. must be met, right? That doesn't mean that you always act cowardly to, for, for, for guaranteed self-preservation and comfort, you know, because um, most situations that we, that we face aren't quite a life and death situation, but we project them to that level. But going back to what you said of stagnation, I think it's worse. I think when, because li life is like, you know, a river, like we're, we're constantly moving. We're constantly moving forward. We're constantly growing older. Things are constantly happening. We are moving forward and constantly at a new line of decision-making in our life. There is no stagnation. There is no staying still. There's retreat and there's moving forward. There's contraction and there's expansion. And I think that when we train ourselves, when we choose to act out of courage, I've got this decision before me today. I have to go 
make these calls, have this meeting with somebody important, put myself out there, speak eloquently, present my, whatever it is. I have to put myself in a risky situation and do something that's scary, or I don't do it. I stay in the known realm. I retreat into what is known. I'm actually making an action either way. And when I choose courage, if you look at it, think of it as like concentric circles. When I choose courage, I step into a new arena of concentric circles. There's been a line there that I've acknowledged as something I'm afraid of. And I've said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm still afraid. I'm still not sure if I'm going to succeed. I'm still afraid I'm going to fail, but I'm going to engage it. And then regardless of what happens in that new arena, even if the meeting's a failure and I get rejected, I did it. And I've learned what that experience is like. I've put myself out there. Even if I fail in the effort that I was afraid of by taking the courageous courageous act and the making the courageous choice, I've expanded myself. That's called self-actualization. Yeah. You know, it, it's a key aspect to actualizing who you are inside is taking steps forward in life. Like you said, taking action. When I choose to stay within and say no to that, not only do I, is it not stagnation, it's a step backwards because I'm allowing, I'm allowing that thing that I was afraid of to become all the more numinous, all the more unknown, all the more foreboding and all the more scary. Because not only was it scary to begin with, it's extra scary because I chose not because- You reinforced I trained, it. I reinforced it. I trade my mind that that's too much for me to deal with. And then what I end up having to do is contract to a smaller concentric circle and erect larger boundaries to insulate me from that threat that was at that concentric circle yes. that was once near me, and I'm gonna to have to retreat smaller and smaller and smaller. When we expand, regardless of whether we fail or not, when we expand, we become stronger, we become more capable. <clears throat> I've engaged that problem. I met that CEO, I presented my idea in the office. They said no, but it wasn't that bad. I can do that again. And what's the next step? beyond that. And when we grow, it's not only about our own self-actualization. This is the key to why this has been such a core virtue toward manhood throughout the ages and cross-culturally. It's not just about my own self-actualization for the purpose therein. Self-actualized men are able to offer more to the communities around them. They're able to provide more. They're able to shoulder more burden for the community. They're able to take more responsibility and they're able to give more. You know, they're able to be more generous because they've actualized themselves in larger degrees. When we retreat, we become afraid. We rely on others to protect us from that which we retreated from. We become shameful. And then we try to lie and manipulate and deceive about what we, about our own cowardice and say, oh, it wasn't my fault. It was, it was because this, that, and the other. It's their fault, this, that, and the other. We create stories and enroll people into them and become parasitic to the communities that we're in. So exactly. it's really, the, the repercussions are huge, you know. That's the exact word I was gonna use. There's a, there's a psychological study on like the, the parasitic mind and kind of how you, you, uh, you stop integrating with reality. In other words, it takes courage or it takes action to integrate with reality. And so humans, the amazing thing about humans is that they have, there's reality and then there is your own internal structure, your own world that you've created for yourself. The two, can exist completely independent of each other. You could be in a room uh, totally disconnected from reality and believe yourself to be a king. It's irrelevant. It's in your own mind. You have an entire universe within yourself. Now, the people who contribute the most to society, the people who are often most uh, happy, most integrated, have the best relationships, are people who are integrated with reality. In other words, the closer your internal world is to the real world, the better you will do in the real world. The more disconnected you are from it, the more, as you said, you'll become parasitic, you'll become dependent. It, a huge part of it is major dependence that every time you're absolutely right, every time we're faced with a choice and we uh, side with fear and we kind of cower to it, we close off, we separate ourselves one step further from reality because we now do not know, we now have to imagine how that situation would have played out. Right? Like you said, I went, I did it, I realized it wasn't that bad. Sure. Now, failure is irrelevant to your ability to integrate with reality. All you have to do is constantly test yourselves because then you will have the best possible understanding of your limitations as possible. Yeah. And I think we've, it, it, again, to tie it into today, what we do see today is a push that 
No, you are incapable. You are at the whim of the world. You are at the whim of other people. You are a victim. And therefore, you don't need to try and integrate. You don't need to try and test yourself in these situations because you're already failing because of other people. And so people's internal worlds, their fear levels are so high over things that if you just looked at the statistics and you just looked at the reality-based facts around it, you would say there's no reason to have this much fear around this specific subject. I was, uh, I'm going to give a personal story. I got really scared of flying out of nowhere. I don't know why it happened. I suddenly developed a fear around flying, which sucks because I act a lot. And I had to fly from LA to Atlanta to New Orleans. I was constantly flying for my business. I had to fly. And I was, there was one day, and this was the moment, this is the first time, never in my life have I not done something because I was scared. I've always just been like the head on, I'm going to, I don't right. care, I'm going to do it. And there was an opportunity I had that I didn't take because I didn't want to fly. And the night before, I said, I'm not doing it. And I, I canceled the opportunity. I said, I'm backing out. And then that was the first time my father had told me, Elon, it's okay that you did that this one time. It's fine. I've never seen you do that before. He's like, but don't ever do it again. He's like, that's wow. not you. You're not the type of person who does that. And he's like, and if it takes you going on a thousand flights right now to get over this, you're going to go face your fear. That's the type of person you are. You will go on a plane a thousand times. If you need me to come with you the first few times, I will fly to you. And we'll go on a plane a few times. And he's like, and look at the statistics, look at the facts, get comfort in that and then face your fear. And I started just flying more, rationalizing it more. And I stopped being afraid of flying. It was the weirdest thing. I don't know where the fear came from. It obviously came from some kind of idea that, you know, <laughs> I connected it to something in my mind. There were a few bad plane crashes that year. And all of a yep. sudden my own yep. mortality came into play. It represented something much bigger to me, but until I faced it, you know, had I never faced it, had I, and luckily again, I had a positive male role model to come in and say, face your fear. Don't I back know. away from this. That's how you'll overcome it. Yeah. Because all the courses in the world, all the books, all it wouldn't help until you get on the plane or until you do the thing, until you manage to deal with the fear and you reintegrate with reality and you gain your confidence back and you realize the real world can be very scary, but it's often not as, as scary as our, our minds are a lot scarier than the real world. Um, well, that's so cool, man. I mean, you're blessed. To have a not only to have an active father in your life, but a father who will give you that response and not say, it's okay, baby. You don't have to do what you're not comfortable with. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He said, that's okay. And <laughs> do it. Don't go down that path. <laughs> yeah. you know? And do it. Go do it. Yeah. Yeah. We live, you know, we were speaking of the victim world a little bit. We live in, a, in, in an inverted world, right? Um, where it's very common to hear, well, that makes me uncomfortable. It's, well, that makes me uncomfortable. It's like, okay, and what's your point? Mm -hmm. You know, like the traditional man has the response of, and expand your comfort zone. Expand, who's, 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 who does that reflect on? Me or you? The fact that you're uncomfortable with something that's going on or something that I did or something that I said or something that I expect, who does that reflect on, you know? So the idea that I shouldn't have to do something that I'm not comfortable with is the most absurd notion to, among the history of man that could be conceived of. The making of boys into men, a key aspect, and we'll get into rites of passage proper in another bit, but a key aspect was scaring the shit out of them, was <laughs> putting them in situations where they were scared so shitless yeah. that that was so extraordinary that after they faced that situation, regular life, they, they were like, I can handle this. And they never, once they were initiated men, would have the, the, the conceit and self-importance and delusion to think that because something made them uncomfortable, they therefore should not have to do it or that the thing itself was not in their interest or that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. When we seek comfort, I mean, think about that. What if life's path, what if, what if, when we invert the virtues, which is what we're talking about in pop culture here, inverting the virtues from courage, self-expansion, risk, danger, and, 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 and making oneself stronger through courage, right? So that you can be of more service, so you be, be more capable, so that you're not drawing parasitically on people to protect you, so you're not being deceitful and lying. When we invert that to be virtue is comfort, virtue is my safety and my comfort, 
It's a never ending black hole of pulling the entire world into my sphere to keep me comfortable rather than me meeting the world where it's at and even seeking the next frontier so that I can be of service to it. Virtue is inherently creative and godlike. You know, cowardice is, 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 is kind of, uh, is uh, deflating and, you know, what's, what's the word? It's a, uh, um, rolls in on itself, you know, like in, in oh, this right. kind of like destructive satanic way. Yeah. Um, you were talking about when people have their reality aligned with the reality, um, they are, they are the most effective and happy people in life. And I think that it takes courage to align my reality with the reality. There's things in the world that are very frightening, that are very uncomfortable. There's realities of this world when we look at how vulnerable, when I, I'll use I statements here, when I look at how vulnerable I am, when I, when I look at how capricious things can be, when I, when I look at nature, or I look at society or look at this, that or the other and, and really face them and analyze them and try to digest them for how they are. I could choose to tell myself a story that makes me more comfortable for the time being, right? But that's a cowardly thing to do, mm -hmm. to turn on, say, the mainstream media, which is constantly weaving lies and narratives that are completely fallacious, to make people feel comfortable in their own little deluded bubble. Or I could say that's clearly incongruent with the reality and the facts that I see. What are the implications of that? If what I'm seeing is completely, if the facts and reality are completely different than this comforting little lie that's being woven for me, what are the implications of that? And do I have the courage to face what the implications of that are? You know? So all confirmation bias and this whole, this whole denial of common sense where one week something is okay for you, the next week you're outraged by it when someone else does it because, sorry, my lighting here is going crazy. But that, that entire thing is a lack of courage. It's an inability to face the idea that your view of the world might be wrong and that your sources of information might be wrong. And, and, and there's exactly. a really, really interesting documentary with Cassie J that she made years ago. She was a feminist. She went on this uh, yep. journey to interview yep. MRA guys because she had heard how terrible they are and how evil they are and how they're all you know, celebrate rape and all this crazy stuff. And so she started interviewing them. And what she started realized, it's such an interesting documentary. If you haven't seen it, you can just look up Cassie J. Offhand, I don't know the name of her documentary, but please watch it. I know you've seen it. Yeah, we've talked about it, right? The Red Pill, it's called. Yeah, yeah. oh, The Red Pill. It's brilliant. Anyway, the most interesting thing about that documentary is her journey. It's her, yeah. her willingness to look at the world as she first saw it and then completely shift and you could see what a toll it took on her. And the, she breaks down numerous times in that documentary because her entire view of the world is challenged, but she's willing to face it. She never backs down at the consequence of every single person in her life turning on her. Exactly. Every single one. She now became the, the target of uh, this kind of vicious vitriol because those same people are in a constant state of fear that if they're yep. challenged by any form of truth, Yep. that it will destroy their worldview. She was an example of absolute courage, a perfect exactly. example of it, it, it like exactly. as clear as day. Martial arts, I could think offhand of a great example is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's such an effective martial art against other martial arts because it takes people out of their element, right? You take people to the ground, they're not used to that kind of range and fighting. Everyone knows how to throw a punch instinctively. People don't know how to grapple instinctively in terms of doing an arm bar or choking someone. These things have to be taught. And so you find, I've been in this situation. I went up against, when I had been doing jujitsu for like five, 10 years, I went up against martial artists who'd been training 30 years who were very, very, very well-known kickboxers, very well-known Mu Muay Thai guys. And I said, okay, we're going to do fighting, but I'm allowed to take you down. And I would take them down and tap them out, take them down and tap them out. And there were two types of reactions that happened literally two types of reactions. There was the people who the next day were in a jujitsu class and would train like maniacs. Yeah. They, got a, they faced reality. They said, oh, this is something I need to learn. Now what mm -hmm. they realized is that all their years of striking didn't go out the window. It just made yeah. that better. It now meant you sure. couldn't take them down. You couldn't do those things. Where yeah. the other response was, oh dude, that's pathetic. I'm never gonna end up on the ground. Oh, I could have done this. Excuse, excuse, excuse. And never touching it, never willing to spar again, never willing to face it again. 
And yeah. again, they created their own imaginary boundary where yeah. anytime someone brought up jujitsu, they have like a fear response or a panic response because they know that they, unless they go face that fear, unless they go integrate with the world, they cannot deal with that. Yep. Um, and it's hard work. So those are just two examples that really stuck out in my mind that were- Those are great examples. Yeah, I mean, I think they're perfect. And um, I think they're, they're both great. And you know, getting, getting spurned and rejected by your insular community, I think is one of the, the most fearsome things that most people, the biggest, the most visceral fear that so many people have. I mean, dying and like mortal disease is pretty big but social rejection and getting reamed out publicly, getting publicly shamed, like Cassie J faced up to, um, keeps so many people in a complacent little bubble. And so if your bubble consists of a particular narrative about how the world is or what's going on in the world, if it's fake and if it's false, and if you get some intimation or some facts or some, 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 some perception or a reality check like in the, in, with Cassie J or jujitsu or whatever, that you're missing something and then you choose to say, no, that something's not real. You're, you're refuting facts. You've erected a wall between you and the world, therefore making yourself more susceptible to, to being governed by, by your own fear, right? Jordan Peterson's a good example. When Jordan Peterson came out and started standing up for what he believed in, freedom of speech, he was fighting Bill C-16 in Canada. Yep. The type of response against him was so vicious. And at the yeah. time, he could not know how revered he'd become. Because the interesting thing is when you often do take a position of courage, down the road, you will be respected for it. You will be celebrated for it. I really believe that. I do believe that people like Cassie J, people like Jordan Peterson, people who stand up and say, this is what I believe in. This is the side of truth. We have to be able to have these <laughs> discussions and have these ideas. Anyone who's standing up for freedom of expression, freedom of, of debate and of ideas is always going to be on the side of truth. Uh, and so long term, I believe that they will be remembered by history as great. Uh, it's just in that moment to go against every single person in your life and have them turn on you in that way. Yeah, um, it, it's tremendous. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I can think of numerous examples, sadly, nowadays, you know, where that's become the norm to have to do that. Right. So, I mean, going back to just the cultural situation that we're in and like the conflation of, of virtues, um, it'd be one thing if we were being, if we were being encouraged to, if we were being encouraged, right, to, to be more, to, it'd be one thing if courage was still being acknowledged as a virtue and we were in, in, in the pop culture narrative was such that it was saying, you don't have to live up to this quite as much as you used to. Like traditional values are a little bit strong. They're a little bit too hardcore. They're a little bit too stringent. We can let up on those a little. But what we have instead is a complete inversion, like you're saying, where there's an attack on courage, like this is actually a detrimental or um, uh, damaging standard to have. And instead we get, we get a, we get a inverted situation where the, where the, you, you strive for, um, for comfort. You strive to say, I'm, I'm virtuous by, Hey, Elon, what you're saying makes me, you're making me uncomfortable. Like in that I take the upper hand of power yes. by virtue signaling that you've done something wrong. And the only signal that I've made is that I'm uncomfortable. Yes. How is that? How is that a virtue? It takes no effort. It takes no self-application. There's no spectrum of self-development. There's nothing that good that comes from that. And yet that's how it plays out in our culture is to play the card of, uh, of comfort or safety. Oh, I'm so scared. I'm so scared of COVID. I'm so scared of white supremacists. I'm so scared of whatever it is. I can speak of how scared I am of what I'm supposed to be scared of. And that is seen as virtuous. Oh, he's a virtuous guy. He's scared. Mm -hmm. He's scared. He's We're staying in his through. house, in his room with the doors locked with, with, you know, a, a sign out front that says all the right things. He's good rather than somebody confronting the world, engaging things, learning the truth and living in a, in a courageous, in a courageous way. It's, um, it's, it's amazing, you know, how we, how we've gotten to this place. And it's, it really does lead the culture 
and we can get to a more cultural perspective in another bit too, but on, on an individual level, it really is a, an inward turning vortex that, that uh, is very destructive, I think, to the, to the individual psycho soul makeup. Of, well, it's of interesting. People. Yeah, because we, um, we celebrate victimhood. You know, the, the Ju Jesse Smollett or Juicy Smollett <laughs> thing is a perfect example, but there's hundreds of Juicy Smollett's or Jesse Smollett's. They're yeah. really, that's happening all the time now where right. people are faking hate crimes or faking, oh, I'm a victim of this or someone said this to me. And the reason is because we've taken the word empowerment and we've completely changed its meaning. Empowerment used to mean that you do not perceive yourself as a victim, no matter what's going on. Empowerment used to be you're the person who was uh, uh, legitimately attacked for your skin color. And yet you still rose above it and said, I will not see myself as less than. I will still go back to work tomorrow and I will be the best person at my job. And I will not talk about it. I will bring attention to it. I'll try and change the world for the better, but I will become the best version of myself no matter what you put in my way. Now empowerment means, oh, I am a victim. Empowerment now means, I was just told this and it ruined my whole day. And because I'm an empowered individual, I'm going to go stand up and like make it the biggest deal ever. It's like, that's not real empowerment. I mean, there are two articles I saw today and both of them really made me realize just how every, and these are the only two articles I really saw pop up on my news feed today. And it made me realize how, how much we're programmed. Uh, Cause every day I get articles and I realized all of them are like this. The first one was we have, it's time to stop celebrating motherhood, uh, no, uh, marriage is an accomplishment. Why? Because it puts people who aren't married down. It makes them feel sad. It makes them feel uncomfortable. It makes them feel like there's pressure to get married. And the other one was there was a woman who for some reason had a very, very random, had a very hairy chest. And she's like, I'm empowered because I put down the razor and I've never felt stronger. Now I leave the hair all over my chest. And it's like, okay, well, number one, you, you sh that shouldn't be what empowers you, nor should shaving your chest be what empowers you. And we should, it's just a random <laughs> article. You know what I mean? Like it really serves no, no value or purpose. Sure. Other than maybe she really did see, the problem here is she, she was shaving her chest because she saw herself as less than because of it. Empowerment would have been whether you shave your chest or not, you are still a whole complete person. It had nothing to do with the hair on her chest. It had to do with acknowledging that, okay, this is, I can shave it. I cannot shave it, but I, there's more to me than this. And with the uh, marriage thing, it's again, it's just, we're erring on the side of having to be so sensitive to other people where outrage has become a commodity. It's become a tool, a weapon, right? And so if I'm more outraged than you, if we're having a debate right now and I find a reason to be outraged, I win the debate. I don't actually have to debate your ideas. I don't have to debate. It takes a lot, again, courage to actually sit here and say, I'm not gonna use any excuses. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm gonna admit it. Man, I wish people could go back to that. But that's how we used to have debates. Me and you could sit here, disagree about something, and I can take it away, leave here and say, you know what? He had some really good points. I do have to change the way I think about certain things. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, when you when you blow this out to a societal level, it's like, d did this start? I don't know. You know, we, we, we can go to this place with all the conversations that we have. Did this start as a natural cultural kind of evolution or is this something that's been programmed from the top down? Probably a little bit of both, but one thing's sure is that, yeah, when you have a society that starts to be composed of cowards, you end up the, the, the end product is it can't go anywhere, but to a totalitarian type system. Cause you get a bunch of people who are saying, it's not my fault. I want to be comfortable. Somebody needs to do something about this. Somebody needs to take care of me. I'm not capable of confronting the situations at hand. I don't have to, I shouldn't have to. It's, an injustice for me to have to self-actualize. That's at the core of this. Going back to that idea of self-actualization, expanding the, the, the concentric circles of who you are so that you can be of service. The new position of I shouldn't have to, or it's an injustice for me to have to self-actualize means that a system, a totalitarian system must be created to meet for the, the, the incompetence and the unwillingness or the, um, uh, the apathy, the apathy of the populace as a whole, it's a constant invitation for usually the government to take care of more and 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 more aspects of my life because it's an injustice for me to have to apply myself to do it myself. You know what I'm saying? 
you, you know what it comes it, it it comes down to it, there's all there's another aspect of it where the fundamental difference between confidence and what's the word beyond like when someone is like egotistical or not i don't know what the word is like and they go oh, no, maybe like see themselves as like a god right or whatever it is yeah um, or lacks humility the the real difference between confidence and that that negative thing is that people who are confident are confident within the boundaries of their interaction with the world. In other words, they're confident because they really do know they can do it or believe they can do it because they've done enough things in the real world. Whereas the person who's hyper egotistical or lacks humility and uh, doesn't have confidence, has this other thing that is far more vile, is doing it out of insecurity, is doing it out of a projection of what they believe they can do in the world or uh, because they haven't interacted with the world. Because if the truth is, if, if you could do anything, if you were powerful enough to do anything and you came into a situation and you're like, I could do anything, people would be like, wow, you're a real douchebag. Do you think you can do anything? You're like, no, I really know I can do anything. I'm confident I can do anything. It's not ego, it's actual confidence. So long as I'm functioning within the boundaries of what I know I can do, it, it is pure confidence. And so uh, I think that you're right. We're, it's just, I think it's so sad the things we celebrate in society, you know, not to repeat it again, but that we're ending up uh, pulling away from the ability to create uh, and, and all creation, all beauty, all these great things come from all art, all media, like all the wonderful movies, all, all entrepreneurial behavior comes from courage. You take a risk, you try. And then you try again and you try again and you try again over and over and over and over. And the more we take away from that, the less tries we get, the less of a world we get to create as a whole, as a society. Yeah. Um, and the more we do this, we start zipping our mouths shut. So we create less, we talk less, we interact less, and we pull back into our own worlds. If anything, COVID has really shown how much we can pull back in our own worlds because we're all in isolation and you just see how, how disconnected, how dangerous it is for humans to not interact. You see it in the children, the increases in suicide, alcoholism, abuse, all these things that are skyrocketing. We're not meant to close ourselves off to the world. Exactly. Um, being born into a body is being vulnerable and is being mortal. And I think that, that that's also the key. That's one of the keys. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of end it on this note because I know we don't want to go on forever, but... Um, going back to the rites of passage and scaring the shit out of boys part of becoming human part of being born into a body is 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 becoming mortal right so part of becoming an adult part of becoming an integrated human is intrinsically accepting that you're vulnerable and that you're going to die and it's only through that acceptance and really just internalizing that and accepting it and being like this is how it is regardless of whether i'm in a, in a padded cell with feeding tubes and the government taking care of everything, or I'm exposed out there in the world charting my own way. Either way, I'm vulnerable and I'm mortal. You have to accept that in order to live into life from a place of courage. And when people reject that and say, no, 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 I shouldn't have to be vulnerable. I shouldn't have to be mortal. I shouldn't have to deal with anything risky or dangerous. They, they, uh, yeah, the, the only, the only place that goes is to the singular point of lack of life is almost a life that resembles death to live life fully. It must come from a place of courage and courage can only come from a place of accepting that kind of core truth of, of what it's, what it is to be. And it's hard, it's scary it's hard. To, to look in the mirror and say, I'm going to die, but you know what, if you're going to die, whether you, like you said, whether you're in that padded cell or not, you can't escape it. Yep. Um, and again, I don't want to keep going, but I just find it interesting that that's kind of what it fundamentally comes back to in the end, which ties into this whole idea of an absolute truth versus nihilism, right? Where you have a belief in something uh, and some kind of foundational yep. truth of God or whatever that thing may be. And we won't get into this today, but it just does bleed very nicely into this. So maybe on the next one, we'll touch on that a little bit, if you're cool yeah. with that, because courage does really lead into this. Now I'm realizing it, but it really does lead into that. Totally. All right, man. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah. And thank uh, you. yeah, to everyone who watched, if you like, please uh, like and subscribe to the channel. Jordan's going to be on every week and uh, also going to keep doing interviews with police and anyone who actually has anything interesting they want to talk about who wants to come on is more than welcome to come on. So thank you very much. And thanks again, Jordan.